want to dedicate uh, our learning uh, for the salute of bringing back our hostages and uh, protection of our soldiers and uh, for Am Yisrael and for all the innocents. And uh, with that, we shall begin. Uh, so based on uh, something that um, came up with, that uh, Paul had mentioned about Kutim, I thought we should do a little introduction to the Kutim, and then we'll go back into the Gemara proper. The story of the Kutim traces back to this um, Perak in Malachim Bet, Perak Yud Zayin. And um, it's part of the story of the exile of the ten tribes. Uh, so here in Perak Yud Zayin, we read, Mishnat Shtei Masri La'achaz Melech Yudada Malach Oshea Ben Ela B'Shomono Yisrael Teish Hashani. So at the time that Ahaz was the king of Yehuda, Hosea becomes the, <coughs> the king of Israel. And Vayas Harabe in a Hashem Rak Lokamache Yisrael Asher Hayulafanav. He was not a good king, we'll say. And Allah Alasha Maneser Melech Ashur. Vayhi lo Hosea Eben Vayashev lo Mincha. So Shalmaneser comes from Ashur, he comes from the north, and uh, he makes um, he makes Israel a vassal state. They have to bring him tribute. So the king of Ashur finds out that Hoshea is is a Kesher here means like a conspiracy uh, that he uh, sent agents to so the king of Egypt and he stopped bringing the tribute. So the king of Ashur, Shalmaneser, uh, jails him by Israel Beit Kale. Vayal melech Ashur b'chol ha'aretz, vayal shamon, vayatza elash shalosh shanim. So the king of Ashur comes, and he uh, lays siege to Shamron, which is the main area. And in the ninth year of Hoshea, lachad melech Ashur at Shamron, vayegel at Yisrael Ashura. Right? So in the, in the ninth year of Hoshea, he exiles the he exiles Israel, which are the Ephraim <laughs> tribes. So it says where he exiles them to. It was because because or in light of the fact that Bnei Israel Sin to Hashem, it's interesting. The, so the Pasuk emphasizes that it, this is Hashem who brought them out of Egypt uh, from under the hand of Paro, and they feared other gods. This is an important issue, but I don't mean, think we'll get into it right now. Right, so they followed the laws of other nations uh, that God had driven off. Before them, they who b'nei Yisrael tvarim asher lochein al Hashem elohehem. They tried to b'nei Yisrael hid things that were improper uh, to Hashem. They ivnu lahem b'mot b'chol arehem mimigdal notzim adir mitzar. They built places of idol worship all over the place. They etzivu lahem matzevot v'ashirim. And by the way, here when it says that if they hid, it's Kilu they hid, right? The Mufashim talk about it. It's Kilu they hid this. That is, we have from Mother Nevi'im this idea that Bnei Israel 
sin against Hashem, uh, saying to themselves that, you know, God isn't here or God doesn't see, right? that uh, as, if, as if God is not really able to see their sins. So they did all manner of things to make God angry. Uh, other aspects of idol worship. Hashem gave testimony to them through his prophets. It's a, this is a recap, you know, of things that happened that he didn't, Hashem gave them fair warning because he sent prophets to them to warn them. But they didn't listen and they stiffened their neck uh, like their, um, like the necks of their fathers that didn't believe in God, their, their Lord, or Lord, their God. Again, that they they sin nonetheless. Again, it, it summarizes. Who, who are those people? Because they, they said at the beginning that they were deported. So probably not everybody was deported to Ashur. I think the way you need to read these psukim is this is this is now recounting all of the sins that they did that that made Hashem uh, uh, be before the deportation, but, right? To, to made Hashem get the you know uh, mm. the exile. Of course, it, this is has been written by a um, Yehudai. Uh, presumably, and, they, and yeah. they had the, they didn't very much like one another. The Malchut Israel and Malchut Yehuda. That's also true for the most part, right? The, here and mm. there, there were uh, there had there were bonds, but those are other stories. Uh, mm. Yeah, actually, a little bit earlier. Again, all of these, we could spend quite a long time on this parak, but um, we're just going to take it in a very superficial way that these are all things that they were doing, all these things of Avodah Zarah, so presumably this is, you know, even after they were warned by the prophets, they continued and in a sense even dug down, maybe even did more and more work, you know, bad things. So Hashem uh, got angry at them, the Israel, right? So Israel, again, we're talking about the northern tribes. By Sireme al Panav, he removed them from his face. Lo Nisha Rak Shevit Yudalavado. Only Shevet Yehuda was left, and it's unfortunately put out. It's also Binyamin. The Binyamin was a small tribe, and they're subsumed under Yehuda. Gam Yehuda lo shamat mitzvot Hashem Eloheihem vayachu b'chukot Yisrael asher asu. Right, so they also weren't doing so great at this time, and they went in, in the, in the uh, you know, in the ways and the, the, the laws that Yisrael we're doing. We'll see how this works out. It's a little bit different. So Hashem is disgusted with all of the seed of Israel. And here it means it would include even Yehuda, but they don't get kicked out right away. But it's also interesting, which would, you know, this would, um, 
be a inui, like Lashon Inui, like he inflicted them. But by name be Shasim, he placed them in the hands of, of uh, their plunderers. This is also the uh, the Targum here also says that uh, Bozazim, until he threw them out from in front of him. And here, as he goes back, it, it goes back to the very beginning of the um, the split in the nation, right? That uh, the the Kara Yisrael, and here Yisrael refers. Um, you could understand this actually in either way, but you can understand it to refer to the, the ten tribes. That they tore themselves from Beit David, and they uh, they crowned uh, Yaravam ben Nevat. From the time of Yaravam, he made them to sin, and that's of course the story of, of Yaravam, and he set up places of idol worship and so forth. So they went in this, the ways of Yaravam. Uh, Until Hashem removed them from, from in front of him. As all his servants, the prophets had sent, so they were all exiled to Ashur. So the king of Ashur um, brought from Bavel and from these all these places, from Bavel, from Kuta, Ava, Hamat, Svarvayim. He brought the populations from those places that he had conquered, and he settled them in the cities of Shomron instead of in Israel. So it wasn't just that Israel were exiled, they were exchanged. There was a population exchange. And uh, that was that's that's how you did it back in the day. That's how the nations would do it. If you wanted to take over a, a country or whatever country would be, you know, any land area, you got rid of the native population and then you took people from another place and put them there, and you exchanged them. Uh, and even though I haven't read this in probably about, I don't know, 40-some years, but as I recall, Machiavelli uh, cites this in the prints, not, not necessarily this Sukim, but this whole idea. Machiavelli says this is how you, do, this is how you hold on to conquered land, because if you leave the native population in place, they're much more likely to rebel, and they also have a home advantage because they know the land, and they know better how to uh, prepare themselves for attack and so forth. So this is what... That's the, what the Germans did in Luxembourg. They well, they didn't finish, well, but they deported a, a, a part of the, the population of the Luxembourgers to Pomerania, East Pomerania, and they brought Germ German people to Luxembourg. Luxembourg. After the war, when the war was over, people went back to their places, but they didn't, don't feel, not everybody, but they were doing it. Yeah, and also, look, that's also, well, the Russians, uh, you know, the Soviets, at least they did this, that part. There was, they, they sent, they sent uh, Russians Russians into places that they took over to try to Russify them, although they didn't necessarily displace all the population. In some places, you know, but of, you know, under Stalin, they killed a lot of their own people. And anyway, it's not a nice. Well, in Lithuania, they didn't also in K Königsberg in like Kaliningrad. 
Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. Up in yeah. Up in the north. Uh, in any event, so this is this is what's going on. Uh, now, this is where it gets more pertinent to our discussion. So, first of all, we see here that people come from Kuta. So, the, so I want to point out uh, Kuta. So he says from Babel and from Kuta. Kuta is identified as being here near present-day Baghdad. Oh, it's not too bad. Uh, near Baghdad and Fallujah, and, uh, these places, like what's not today central Iraq. Uh, that was that was the general area that uh, present-day archaeologists have determined, or at least that's the theory. But it, it makes sense that they came from relatively far away and they uh, they bring them in to this place. So they put them in, they replaced, they put them in the cities that were in Shomron and under, you know, instead of B'nai Yisrael. Uh, right, so they took over the Shomron. So now this is this part is very interesting. So in the beginning of their dwelling there, they were not fearful that they, they weren't fearing Hashem, which is of course we we understand Hashem is the one God. <coughs> so they weren't fearing God. So so he sent lions to them and they were killing them. So but so by what happened? So they told the king of Ashur who put them there. So the people that you put there in Shamron, they don't know the judgment, or they don't know the laws and the ways of Hashem, who is the God of the land. So they're being killed by God. In other words, they got the message. But it was, so it's interesting. So they have this idea, as it was in the ancient world, that every country had its God or pantheon of gods. And those were the gods that you had to worship and pay tribute to and so forth because they were the gods of that land. So their theory is that they must be... Getting... The, they are not a, the god is not attached to a people, but it's god is attached to, to the to, land. To territory, to, to a place. To... Exactly. It's strange. That, that's not the way we understand it. No, so that's not the way we see it. And... This is also, it's also it, in the context of Tanakh, we understand Afghan not like that. Like, it's one of the things we say about Yitziat Mitzrayim, Hashem is Hotzi Goy Mikarev Goy. He takes the Bene Israel as a, as a nation outside, you know, from, from within, like he extracts them from the nation of Egypt. So, in. But he is, but he is the, the God of the people, not, not of the territory. Exactly, yes. exactly. So, it doesn't, well, it, although, it, although, although in Midrash, at least, there is the idea of angels, there, there being angels specific to a particular place. You mean because of what we you learned about uh, Esav, uh, Esav's angel wrestling with Yaakov and all of that? Or, or actually, I was thinking about the Midrash of the Sulam, where the angels uh, were based as a changing of the art. Yeah, so that that that's another that's another uh, thing, and there is there is such a notion, but there also it's the angels of ultimately are ag- agents of Hashem. So in the what it what it reflects here is that the mindset of the the people like generally people at that time in. Mesopotamia, the Levant, you know, these areas, was that each territory, you know, each 
place had its god or set of gods, you, usually a set of gods, and then like with one main god. And B'nai Israel are exceptional because B'nai Israel understand, they, they should have understood, right, from the beginning, that there is one god, there's only one god, and uh, it doesn't matter where they go, that's going to be their god. But this new population that's installed in Shomron that came from Babel and Bhutan, all these places, they still have the mindset that the god is the god of that place. And so they're saying to Melech Hashur, they, this gets reported to Melech Hashur, that the reason these people are getting consumed by, you know, killed by lions is because they're not properly following the God of, the God of that place, the God of Israel. So, right, so what happens, right? So he, he does, he cares, he doesn't want them to be killed because that also won't be good for his own self-interest. So he tells them, so bring one of the Kohanim that you exiled from there, and they'll go there and they'll dwell there, they'll dwell back in Shomron. So they bring one, and that's what they do. They bring one of the Kohanim, so now we have to think about the nature of the Kohanim that they would bring back, because remember, these were Kohanim that were exiled from Yisrael, so they're not the Kohanim Amishamshim Beit HaMikdash. These are not, they're not, um, they're not, as we would say now, they're not from people necessarily, they're not people who are Yirei Hashem per se, but they're but people. They come from Shiloh, from, from the north of uh, Beit Amidash. They, they come or from. Or maybe Shomron, I don't know. There uh, were uh, several uh, of them. Okay. Well, here, so here's the thing it says Kohanim, they brought Kohanim who were exiled. So who was exiled? The 10 northern tribes. Israel, Israel, Israel. 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 Mm -hmm. Right. So Israel, so it's one of the Kohanim of Israel. So. Um, you know, for for most of the time from Yeravam on, not until Achav, uh, most of the avodah, as it were, that was done by Yisrael, right, the in the north, it was a shiluv. They were people who Yeravam's innovation wasn't to outlaw the worship of Hashem. It was to integrate the worship of other gods. It was to it was to say that, you know, you yes, we have Hashem, but we also have these other gods, and that's 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 the way worship was set up. And that was part of a very uh distinct, you know, very uh intent in intended what I can't think of the word, intentional. It was an intentional plan on the part of Yeravam because he understood at the very, at the beginning, at the outset of his kingdom, that he couldn't cut these people off. He let them, he would let them go to Yerushalayim for the Ali, for Ali Allah Rega. But he wanted them to not to do that. So what he did is he instituted other Mikdashim with other gods but he didn't outlaw the worship of Hashem, and that fit into this mindset in the, you know, in that part of the world at that time, that you know you can worship Hashem, but you could worship these other gods too. So this, so this, is, I think, is how we have to understand this Kohen or the Kohanim that they bring to teach the these the newly arrived population. These are people who know Mishpat Hashem. They know that they know the way Hashem is supposed to be worshipped. And that they're brought in for that expertise. But it doesn't mean that they're going to teach them that there's only one God. 
ויבואו אחד מהכהנים אשר היגלו משומרון, וישב בבית אל, והיא מורה אותם איך יראו את השם. So he, he tells them how this is how you fear God. והיו עושים גוי גוי אלוהיו, so each nation that was brought in, they're going to each do their gods, ויניחו בבית הפעמות אשר עשו השומרונים, גוי גוי בעריהם אשר הם יושבים שם. So remember, we said earlier the Shomronim, that is like the the Israel, the the Israel that lived in Shomron. He described that they had all, you know, all manner of places of worship for Avodah Zarah. And so now the new population comes in. They and they install their gods into these places. ואנשי בבל עשו את סוכות בנות, ואנשי חוט עשו את נרגל, ואנשי חמת עשו את אשימה. And here it, it details that these were the gods from the different places. So בבל had, uh, they had סוכות בנות, there are different interpretations of what that, what that means, but one of them is that סוכות is not from the word סוכה, but it's from the word סכבי. which means a, a chicken, right? And I'll tell you the Seth um, And Anshay Kud made Nergal. There's a, I just started to look at this uh, recently that there's, um, there's a Wikipedia article about Nergal in particular. It was one of the popular gods that came from this area of Babylonia. And on Sheikh Hamad made Ashima. So they installed these gods into, the, into their place. Now remember, you know, what was their problem? Their problem was that they were getting killed by lions. And so they had to learn how to fear God. So they get taught by Kohanim that were from Israel. But what we're understanding as we continue reading, and this is this seems to be the way that it's going, that maybe they maybe now they start to incorporate Mishpat Hashem, but along with the gods that they're familiar with that they've imported. Right, so everybody introduces their gods in their manner, manner of worship. But, they also feared Hashem. So they also introduced worship of Hashem. At Hashem hayu yireim, ve'et Eloheihem hayu ovdim, k'nishpat ha'goyim asher higlu otam misham. So they integrated the worship of these of their God with with the God of Israel. It's an, exa an example of syncretism. That's which, the word. Which, yes. the, that's the, the way it was. The, the world was at that at that time. You see, even even with the Romans and the and the, the Greeks, they also acted the same way. They took the gods of one another and. Uh, Yeah, they, they, <laughs> yeah, I think in the case of the Romans, they just basically took, right, they just took the whole pantheon and gave them different mm -hmm. names. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but you can also say that's the history of Christianity. Christianity is full of syncretism. Uh, as it goes around the world, it's one of the ways that Christianity becomes accepted. And acceptable in in all kinds in of countries. South America, there are things like this. Also, maybe in Africa. I don't, I don't know. Yes, mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, Michael Werner might know something. <laughs> no, right in in South America, this this is common, and it lasts until today. This syncretism of Christianity with local religions. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's it's something that you know it never really died out this uh, the, this idea so we see it goes you know this is what it's what this is what's being described so they're still doing as they 
as they as they had in the past, which is now what's interesting here. Again, we could go into different perushim because a moment ago it says at the Shem Hayu Yirayim, but it says now it says Einam Yirayim at the Shem Ve'Einam Losim Kifu Kotam Mekom Mishpatam Mekutorah Mitzvah. In other words, um. Well, let's read a little bit further. Vayichrot Hashem yitam b'rit vayitzavim lemor lo tiru elohim achirim v'lo tishtach abelahem v'lo tabdum v'lo tizbuchu lahem ki im et Hashem asher he'ala adchem me'eretz Mitzrayim shuv ze chuzer ha'inyan shel yitziat Mitzrayim v'chol ha'ch gadol v'zor ha'netuya l'to tirao v'lo tishtach avu v'lo tizbuchu But those kutim, they didn't come from Egypt. Why... Why you would say such a thing? Oh, no, no. Okay, so here, so this is where it is. So where it says, mm-hmm. This must now be talking about, um, this must now be talking about uh, B'nai Israel. In other words, that we're, we're going back, but that, that these other people, I, you know, there di- again, there are different ways of understanding the the sukim here. Um, here, I'll show you. Let's see, um, Rashi sa- says here, "Hey, Moshim from Mishpatim, that Enami Reim et Hashem Yirash Leima Kamishpat Yisrael, this is pertinent to this uh, understanding the status of the Putin. So it's referring to this new population. And they, so what, what forces the new population to adopt Hashem as, as their God, or at least as one of their gods, is this fear of getting killed by lions. So Chazal called them Gerei Arayot. The, the original Kutim are called Gerei Arayot, that they converted because of lions. And now it's, just, it's describing them, and what it means, Enami Reyet Hashem, Rashi says what it means, it's not a complete Yirat Hashem. K'moshim Faresh V'holech, Enam Oskim B'Torah V'mitzvot Asher Tziva Hashem Et B'nei Yaakov. They're not, they haven't adopted in a fulsome way the Torah and mitzvot. They were, they were going in the way that these Kohanim, who were, re, you know, brought back from Ashur, the way they taught them, and the way they taught them is that you you have to worship the local god, which is Hashem, but you could also worship your other gods. Um, they, they didn't follow the Torah the way Hashem had commanded B'nai Yaakov. In other words, who, God made a breed with B'nai Yaakov, etc. So this is just going, this this part all refers to the B'nai Yaakov at the end of the two uh, psukim ago. Um, yeah. I'm, that's very strange because the Shiba Mamim had to be destroyed because they didn't uh, worship uh, Hashem, and they were uh, they were considered as dangerous. But here you have another way. They are, okay, okay, those people are not the Shiva. I mean, they come from from uh, far away, but nevertheless, now they they are living there, and. You, you don't. Nobody says that sh- they should be destroyed because they they don't uh, uh, worship Hashem. But, um, what what, uh, what uh, the text says that they should be um, um, it, 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 
So you're asked, so you, you could ask the question right in two ways. So why? Sure. <laughs> this was very bad, very bad English. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. Listen, I mean, mm -hmm. for somebody who's trilingual, I feel, at mm -hmm. least, I don't know if you know other languages, but uh, you do very <laughs> well. Um, no, so what's the what's the point? So you're saying, look, B'nai Yisrael came in, they had a commandment to wipe out the seven nations. So, but I want to correct you a little bit. They, they, the commandment to wipe out the Shivat Amamim is not because they weren't Yirei Hashem or Ovdei Hashem. It was because of the excesses of their Avodah Zarah. That's the, I mean, that's just Pshat in the Torah. That's just the way the Torah presents it. It was the because they had, right? As you go through the Torah, we have this idea that their God doesn't wipe does God doesn't expel them before Kibush Yahushua. He part of part of the timing of Kibush Yahushua. This gets complicated, but part of the timing of Yahushua of Yahushua's uh, invasion. Uh, is tied to this idea that the sin and the sins of the seven nations had reached a peak beyond which they could no longer stay in the land. So, and also, so we get we get this from the Torah. The Torah, in terms of in terms of conquering the land, so we have a special mitzvah to to thoroughly destroy the seven nations. And that's because of their level of Avodah Zarah. And we're not even allowed, you're not allowed to make a breach with them. You're not even allowed to expel them. You really have to wipe them out. So that's a reflection of their particular level of sin in, regard, in regards to uh, their staying or not staying in the land. Other people who come into the land, so what you know, they, from Chazal we would understand that what people who come into the land are allowed to dwell in the land if they if they keep the Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noah. So you could say that's a later uh, that's a later concept. You know, if you wanted to be more academic about it, but I think Gam Mipshuto Shel Mikra. We and and especially here, this this whole parak is a good example that um, there's an I, there's an idea that anybody who comes to live in the land has to keep mishpat Hashem. That part is true. Shivatam, I mean, weren't given the chance because they had already gone too far in a way that's somewhat conceptually parallel to what happens to Mitzrayim. That is, at a certain point, because Paro, at a, cer at a certain point, Paro doesn't really have the chance to do tshuva anymore. So similarly, Shivat Amamim don't really, aren't really given a chance to do tshuva. Because tshuva, as we see, I'm jumping around, but as you see from the story of Yonah and Ninveh, even of De Avodah Zarah, who understood that there is Hashem could be given a chance to do tshuva and so it's not only about it's not only about simply that they were idol worshippers that it's it was it was that they were idol worshippers in excess and they were doing deeply immoral things that's how I would view this so um Let's let's continue on here a little bit. This is all again continuing talking about the Bnei Yaakov. They they went back to doing the things that they were always doing. So this is the end of the parrot. In other words, the newly installed Goyim that came from Babel and Kuta, etc. They were Yirei Hashem. 
and they also worship their idols. So, um, would be, um, I think, you know, at least till sometime, it, it, at least based on Chazal, this would be at least till sometime in the late first temple period, is, is what it's describing. So, at the end of this parak, we have these several goyim that are brought from other places that Ashur had conquered. And this is the idea that, you know, Bas and Chayri v'yirbev et Rimot. This is when nations were uprooted from one place and placed somewhere else. So based on this passage, we understand that the people from Kuta or from Kut were Gere Arayot, they converted under the fear of being killed by lions. And it was this semi-conversion in the sense that they do adopt uh, some Yirat Hashem under the, uh, out of this fear, but they also continue to worship their idols. So when you get to the time of the second temple, in particularly the late Second Temple, so we know that the Mishnah and contemporaneous sources talk about the Kutim. And so the Kutim of that time were descendants of these people. The Kutim for their part, and these are the people that we would associate today with the Shomronim, the, today, the Shomronim of today. The Samaritans, but, but there's the Shomonim don't worship any more than other gods. They they do worship um, the Kadosh Hashem, okay? Right. So already, also, also in in the in, in, in old way, without Chazal, without the. Um, oh. So this already, this phenomenon of the Shomonim, the way they are today. This already starts to appear by the Second Temple period, mm -hmm. that the Kutim of that time, it's a machloket tanaim about uh, the Kutim. It was a machloket in the time, even the late Second Temple period, about whether the Kutim were still worshipping idols or not. But it was generally understood. So, And because of that, there were certain hashashot, uh, that were associated with the Kutin. But there are also Rabbanim who thought that they were no longer worshipping idols on the one hand, but they didn't adopt Torah Sh Shabal Peh. They, they didn't adopt the oral Torah. And uh, so then you get statements like from uh, Rabban Gamliel, as I recall, who says that uh, any mitzvah that the Kutin adopt, you know, it's mitzvah Tashem that they adopt, they're, they're very careful about like they were they were at least as careful as Jews because they took it very seriously but they didn't generally adopt uh the mitzvot uh, or the Torah Shabbat, Torah Shabbat Peh, the way Chazal understood mitzvot so I could go into some later sources about it but I think some of them are going to come up from time to time but it's always going to refer back to this basic idea for their part, the Shomronim, as you as you probably know, and even the Kutim, by it, certainly by this time of Bayit Sheni, they already they saw themselves as the indigenous people. They didn't they didn't see themselves as a transported people at some at some point. They they considered themselves to always have been there. And you get stories like in the beginning of Ezra when uh, Zerubbabel comes back to rebuild the temple, that the like local people come up to him to and offer to help build the, the new, t you know, to rebuild the temple. And he rejects them. It's famously he rejects them. He says, It's not for you and for us. It's only, it's only for us. So they weren't, they weren't accepted. And based on those who came there in Ezra and also in Nehemiah. And 
<clears throat> later things that we have from Chazal, we understand that Chazal looked at the Kutim as being having this quasi status. So for certain things in Halakha, we trust Kutim, and for certain things we don't trust Kutim. And the only other thing I'll say about it as we go, you know, as you as you go through Mishnah and Gemara and other um uh Chazalic literature, the, the sometimes the word kuti refers to kuti mamash, and sometimes it was installed there by a censor. And that it, in places I think we've mentioned this before, right? But when when you see in Chazal anything that refers to a non-Jew, there are lots of different terms for non-Jews. You have Obdei Avodah Zorah, you have right, Akum, those, those kinds of things. You also have the word Nachri, you also sometimes have the word Goy, you have the word Kuti. All of these, all of these are words that they're not interchangeable. They all mean something very specific. But because of censorship, which was often self-imposed, often Jews censored the uh, the Talmud and the Mafarshim themselves to appease the Christians, to appease Christian authorities, so that they would not destroy their books, like like they did in Paris in the 13th century, where all of the copies, all of the known copies of the Talmud, were rat rounded up in Paris and burnt publicly and there were you know in history there were other public burnings of books that one particularly famous so you always have to be careful when you look look at the word kuti if it's referring to a kuti mamash sometimes it's clear that it's referring to kutim and sometimes it's not so clear and nowadays where we have restored versions of most of these texts you can usually check like uh Steinsaltz and uh, also what you hear on um, Al HaTorah, a lot of times they'll have the notes you can click on. And they'll tell you what what's in earlier texts and and if this is from the censor or not. But just as a general warning, so uh, when Paul, so I think Paul, you had brought up this uh, idea that the Kutim were in Babel. The Kutim came from Babel. But they were the Kutim as we know them are people who came to live in Eretz Israel. So that wasn't immediately important for what we're learning now, but since it had come up, I thought we should take a little time to to look at that. But now, for those of you who are still awake. <laughs> Let's um let's go back to let's go back to the Gemara. So if you remember in the Gemara, we're still dealing with the question of the size of the Kotev and Hagasa. So this is what we read through last week, and hopefully today we'll flesh it out a little more clearly. So we have we had Rabbah who held that um, Kotevet, that the Kotevet Hagasa is a little bit more than a Kibetza. And now we have Rav Zvida Mark, Kotevet Hagasa Shamru Chasra Chasra Mi Kibetza. The Kotevet Hagasa that they said that there's, that's referred to in the Mishnah, it's less than a Kibetza. And he's going to bring a proof text. So what's his proof text? Didnan Beit Shammai Omrim Soor B'Kazayit Chameitz B'Kikotevet So this is the mission at the very beginning of Beit Zah, which maybe you learned, or maybe you didn't learn, but this is one of the, the this is Mikulei Beit Shammai over Beit Yilel. Uh Actually, I think I wait a second. I think I closed that window. Let's, maybe we'll take a quick look then. For those of you who haven't learned, for those of you who have learned, we can do a quick review of um, 
very beginning of Masechet Beit Zah. Yeah. So the the Mishnah says Beit Zashon Ol Davi Yom Tov Bet Shamay Omrim Teachel Beit Tilel Omrim Lo Teachel. So if a if an egg is born, right? If an egg comes out of the chicken on Yom Tov, Beit Shamay says it can be eaten. And Beitila says it cannot be eaten. So I'm not going to go into the details of explaining that. This is a it's a complicated uh between Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai, but it but on the face of it, you understand Beit Hillel here is is Machmir and Beit Shammai is Mekil, right? Because Beit Shammai says Beit Yom Tov Teachel, you can eat it, meaning you can eat it on Yom Tov. Well, after it's after it comes out, Beit Hillel says you're not allowed to eat it on Yom Tov. Uh, but then it goes on to another machloka, and this, by the way, this mission is brought down in Masechet Ediot. Ediot is a you know collection of different various mishnayot from all over the place, and uh, it's brought down with the heading that these are from the Kumre Beit Hillel and the Kule Beit Shammai. Beit Shammai Amrim Soor Bekezayit. So this is also a kula beit shamai, because for what purpose are we talking about soor pegazayit vechametz bekitzav? This is for the isur of bal yirai of bal as uh, we can see here. So what what is it talking about? On on Pesach, <clears throat> so of course we're not allowed to eat chametz or eat uh, soor. So by default, nobody eats soor. What's soor? It's like the yeast or the starter, like a sourdough starter. Right. It's the it's the part you don't eat, but it's what you need to make the bread. So you need something like a sourdough starter to make the bread. So what we'll see, the Gemara uh, explains this, and we'll see it in the Bartanura, that everybody agrees that you're not allowed to eat either of these things, the shiur kazait. You're not allowed to eat a kazait of either chametz or a soor. But what's the machoket? The machoket is about how much you have to have in your possession to be over on Balyar Abayimatsi. Or how much you have have to write in this in other words that okay. Let's see how the bartender explains it. So because I Linyana Khila Kula Alma do Plige to Sebizab Kazayit. Everybody holds that regarding eating you, the Shiur is Kazayit. You're not allowed to eat a Kazayit of of Khamets or of Sawar. Um, and why is that? Because in, there's a pasuk, right? That's from Parsha Tachodesh. Uh, is over. So I see that the pasuk begins with the, the pasuk begins by telling us you're not allowed to have any soor. Because you're not because you're not allowed to eat chametz, so right? This is how Chazal understand it. it. Begins with soor and ends with chametz. So it's to say that for the for the isur of achila, they're the same. That they are the same for the purposes of the isur of eating on Pesach. Their machloket between Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai is about biur chametz. Beit Shammai savre midach atav rachmana letarvayu soor v'chametz. And this is the Gemara that we're about to look at. It's it's brought down in a couple of places. Soor v'chametz lichtu chametz she'en chimutzo kashe v'afilu hachi chayav levar. The kal v'chomer l'saor should be mitzvah kasher. So Beit Shammai holds. Look, 
we see that even, so we have this one pasuk that equates Saor and Chameitz, the Inyan Achila, but on the other hand, it also distinguishes between Chameitz and Saor. And it's, it, it, so what are Beit Shammai, what's Beit Shammai's reasoning? Since the Torah went out of its way to mention both Saor and Chameitz, it mu there must be a reason that the Torah does this. So, because otherwise, the Torah could have just written Chametz. Uh, I would say, I could have, I, if the Torah had only talked about getting rid of Chametz, then what would I have thought? If I have to get rid of Chametz, all the more so I have to get rid of Seor. Because if what I'm worried about is Chametz is, is uh, ferment, the fermentation that's happening in the dough. So Saor is od yoter, right? Saor is even more chamutz. So certainly I would have to get rid of that. All the more so I'd have to get rid of Saor. So it teaches us that the shiur, in terms of biur, is going to be different, differentiated. That the shiur of chametz and the shiur of sor must not be the same. And I don't learn out the the mitzvah of biur chametz from the isur of achila. Right. So the isur of achila tells me there's one shiur. It's bekezayit. You're not allowed to eat a kezayit of either chametz or of soor. But when it comes to biur chametz, how much uh, above which shiur am I going to be chayav levaer? So here, Beit Shammai says uh, that soor is bekezayit, that chametz is bekekotevet. So, how is this a kula of Beit Shammai? Why is this a kula? Now the the way the way we understand this, right? Beit Hillel Amrim, Beit Shammai Amrim, Soor bekezayit, the chametz b'chakotevet. Beit Hillel Amrim zev zev bekezayit. And now we understand that it's talking about the shiur of Soor and of chametz that you would need to be chayav biur. So less than this shiur, min hadin, like min, min din Torah, you're not chayav the biur. It, it, it's um, the kula because the it would it, in the case that if a, if a kotevet is larger than a kazai, then it's it's the uh, hakil, it's uh, lesser. Because. Uh, You're right. But I just want you to say it out as a whole thought. I had it. Now I lost it. The, um, because the saur so is is uh, much harder. It's uh, more more chametz. More more. Uh, it can cause more uh, mm -hmm. chametz, and that's in the smaller amount. And so. The the chametz is in the larger amount, which is a kotevet. Okay, let so let me help you. So what it, what it's saying is be shemayim rim sor that if you have even a kezayit of chametz, you have to destroy that before Pesach. And chametz, if you have even a kotevet, you have to destroy it. So which is larger, the kezayit or the kotevet? The kotevet it's lar larger, and, so, and so therefore it's the hakil. So then it's right. Then it's the hakel. 
So the, the, the kula is, of, of Beit Shammai is that whereas if you have even a kazayit of chametz, you you will be over if you if you don't you right you'll transgress the sisur of bayra bayamatzei if you don't destroy uh, your kazayit of chame of uh, seor, but you won't be over on chametz until you have at least a kotevet. So it means so it's a kula of Beit Shammai over Beit Hillel because Beit Hillel says zeb is zeb kazayit. He says there's no differentiation between the shiur of chametz and soor for either achila or for biur. Okay, so now let's plug this back into the Gemara that we were doing. So this is where the Gemara brings it. So now Rav Zvid says, the Kotevet HaGasa that Chazal talked about in the Mishnah is less than a kabetza. So how does he know? He says, let's look at this mission in Beitza. And there it says, Beit Shammai says, Soor bekezayit, chametz bekekotevet. That's the mission we just saw. The Havinan ba. So they discuss it. The people in the Beit Midrash in, in Bavel, they discuss this mission. They say, Mai ta'ama de Beit Shammai. What's Beit Shammai's reason for distinguishing between the shiur of Seor and the shiur of Chametz for the inyan of Balira Balyamatze? So the reasoning goes like this: Nichto Brachmana Chametz below Bais Seor, because the Torah could have just said Chametz, and it didn't have to say Seor at all. Why? Because Anamina, I would say. <coughs> That's how I could say it. I could say the Torah, right? So we saw this reasoning, and this was the in the Bartanura, so we're seeing it now in the context of the Gemara. So uh, the Torah could have just said that you have to get rid of chametz, and I would understand for sure I have to get rid of soor, because so if, if I have to get rid of chametz, which is just lightly fermented dough, but certainly I would have to get rid of soor, which is heavily fermented. Uh, so since the Torah separates them and distinguishes between chametz and soor, it teaches you it must be there to tell you that they have different shiuri, that the shiur of chametz and the shiur of soor are not the same. So, and what are they? And then what does Beit Shammai say? They'll say, therefore, soor bekezayit, the chametz bekikotebe. So they come up with this idea that. Okay, the sore the sore is going to be the kazayit, and the chametz is now going to be a larger shiur. It'll be a kikotebe. Now, let's stop for a moment before we go on. And what question might you ask to understand this Gemara better? Michael Schwartz, it's up to you because everybody else is. <laughs> I'm, I'm not in such great shape today. Um, <laughs> and you, you already told me you're not. Yeah, in yeah. Um, we, we talked last week about uh, Kotevet is is uh, was an unusual measure. Um, why why normally it would be a, a bait sign? And in fact, isn't that uh, I, I don't see it here, but that um, that's how. Uh, Rav Zavid starts as why not a beitza? No. He said, well, what Rav Zavid started, he said, Kotevet HaGasa Shamru Chaserah Mikabetza. Right? So it's less than a kabetza. So all I'm saying is here, so here, what this, all of this is, is here to support Rav Zavid, Rav Zavid's contention that the Kotevet is less than a Kabetza because we still haven't finalized the Shiur of the Kotevet, like what, the, what that is in 
in practice. We had okay. Rabbi who says it's more, and now we have Rav Zvi who says it's less. And all of this is in service of Rav Zvi to show that it's to bring a proof for him that the Kotevet is less than a Kibetza. So we still haven't finished that proof. We're in an intermediate stage. And then so, that's the question. How does it help? How does it help uh, Rav Zavid at this point? Okay. Well, actually, the, there's I, the, the more immediate question that I want you to be aware of is it goes like this. So we start with the Shita of Beit Shammai, who differentiates, he distinguishes between Soor and Chameitz for the Isur of Bayira or Bayimatse. So once he distinguishes between them, in what way is he distinguishing? He's distinguishing in terms of their shiur, how much you ha have to have before you're over on Bayere Bayimatse. So once he makes that distinction, so what does the Gemara say? So it comes, Beit Shammai would come to the conclusion that the shiur of this one is not like the shiur of this one. And so what do they say? So or the chametz So our question would be, how do they know? So granted that they know that there are different shiurim, and even granted that one of those shiurim will be a kazayit, because we know that you're over on eating a kazayit, so it would stand to reason that there's a shiur of Bayirai Bayimat say that's Kazayit. But now I have to introduce a new Shir. That's Beit Be Shammai's task is once they have once they have made the argument that the Shiur of Soor and the Shiur of Khamates are different, they have to now give a different Shiur for the for the Khamates. They have or that or to be, they have to give different shiurim to each of them, right? So the question is, how do they know to assign chametz the kikotavit, and how do they know to assign soor kezayit? Why those particular shiurim? And even granted that the <coughs> the soor, why would the soor have the smaller shiur? That we could answer. Why would the sore have a smaller shiur than chametz? Because it is concentrated chametz. Very good. Right? So it's chimutso kashe. Because it's chimutso kashe, so that, and we and we could have learned it out from a kol shikain, from chametz, if not for the fact that the pasuk distinguishes them. But when I have to come to assign a shiur, I'll give the smaller shiur to the sore. So now we're going to be left with the question, how do they know to assign the shiur of Kikotevet to Chametz? That the Gemara doesn't say immediately, and we'll have, to, we'll have to think about it. But I just want you to be aware that this is a question that we should have. In other words, it's not like automatically, if I need, a next, if I need another shiur, I'm going to bump it up to a Kikotevet, as you'll see in a moment, the Gemara is going to say, why did you pick a Kotevet? You could have picked a Kabetza. In other words, the, the, these are other, there are other known Shiurim. The other thing is, which relates back to the question that, that Paul brought up uh, already, what, two or three weeks ago, about where do we get Shiurim from? What, what, what you'll see from the way the Sugya continues, and even from this question here. The que the question of how you, wh which shiur you will assign to which thing, to which, to, uh, to chametz or soor, we have to, we have to say is, under, underlying that is an assumption that A, they need shiurim, that B, that the Torah doesn't specify the shiurim, and so it would be up to Chazal to give them shiuri. So what what's, what Beit Shammai is saying is, I understand the Torah here is indicating to me that there are two shiurim, and Kazayit is like a baseline shiur, because it's the most common shiur for, uh, in the Torah regarding Achila, Yisurei Achila. 
That's like a baseline shiur. But then how does right, but then uh um how does he know the kikotevit? It means there's a there there seems to be something optional about which shiur will now be assigned. In other words, he's not bringing a proof text to say here the Torah is talking about a kotevet. He's just saying it makes sense to say that chametz is a different shiur than sor, and it has to be a bigger shiur. And so I think it should be a kotevet. So, just to keep that in mind. All right, so that's what we're up to in the Gemara. So the Gemara says, <coughs> Excuse me. The e salkadata kotebet hagasa she amru yitera mitle betsa michte bet shamai ashiur de nafish mi kazait kamahadre litne kabetsa. So at this point, the Gemara is going back to Rav Zvid. So Rav Zvid says that the kotebet hagasa is less than a kabetsa. So now we're going to say, this much we know, before we come to Razvid, we have from the Tanaim, we have from Beit Shammai, that there's such a thing as Kezayit for Soor, and he assigns Kotevet to the Chametz. So now, the Gemara is saying, what's the lo- how does the logic of that help me? The logic of that is going to help me as follows. If you would think that the Kotevet Hagasa that we that we're talking about in Yo, in, in Yoma is more than a kabetsa, in that Nifte Beit Shamai Ashur de Nafish Mikazaika Mahadri, in that Beit Shamai is going after a shiur that is greater than a kazayit, litne kabetsa. He could have said the bigger shiur is a kabetsa. V'i nami ki hadadi ninu ne kabetsa. And then maybe you'll say, ah, maybe a kotevet hagasa and a kabetsa are the same size. Then he also should have said kabetsa because it's a more common expression of that size. El alav shma mina kotevet pchuta mi kabetsa. Rather, this implies to us that the kotevet must be less than a kabetza, which the Gemara immediately challenges and says, Mimai, Dilma yo ramemelach, kotevet akasa shamru yitera I could still say that the kotevet akasa that we're talking about is greater than a kabetza. Ha stama kabetza. But stama, that is, a kotevet stam, is the same size as a kabetza. What does he mean? Remember, Beit Shammai doesn't say chametz uh, b'kikotevet hagasa. He says chametz b'kikotevet. And so now we'll say you know, you want to say that be, that the kotevet that Beit Shammai is talking about is the same kotevet as the as the Mishnah and Yom is talking about, but maybe not because he doesn't call it a kotevet agasa. And we want to know what a kotevet agasa is. We want to know if it's bigger or smaller than a kabetza. So the first, so so. It could be that the Kotevet Agasa is bigger than the Kabetza. And what is Beit Shammai talking about? He's talking about a Kotevet. And uh, maybe that's the same as the, as the, maybe that's the same as the Kabetza. The Inami ki Hadadi Ninhu, the Hadaminaya Nakat. And it could be that then you'll say, in other words, then based on that, I would say that what? The Kotevet and the Kabetz are the same. And he chose one of them. In other words, he chose to express his din by talking about a Kotevet instead of the Kabetz. But he could have also equally have said Kabetz. 
we'll go over this again. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to do a, a very quick recap, but I'm not going. Next week we'll pick it up from here, and we'll also go through all of the Rashi's. But this is the ba basically what we see from here is Rav Zvid's contention is that the Kotevet Agasa is smaller than a Kabetza. The Gemara wants to bring a proof for Rav Zvid based on the fact that Beit Shammai distinguishes the Kotevet from the Kazait in the context of Soor and Chametz. And because Beit Shammai there is forced to find a, a shiur that is greater than a kazayit, and he dafka chooses the kotevet, that indicates to me that it must be less than a kabetza. And this we'll see a little bit more in, in Rashi, but let's say one way of understanding that is why, why would he conclude that it's less than a kabetza? Because we would say it would be enough to distinguish the two shiurim by whatever the minimum is. Whatever the minimum, in other words, I'm going to use standard shiurim. I'm not going to make up a new shiur. So I'm using a standard shiur. I'll say, if the Torah is telling me that the shiur of chametz for biur on Pesach is greater than the shiur of Soor, I'll take the next higher standard measure. So Rav Zvid says that's that's why Beit Shammai chose the Kotevet, and he didn't go all the way of choosing the Kabetza. The, the Gemara challenges that and says, maybe not. Maybe that's not, maybe you can't derive that from Beit Shammai, from this Mishnah with Beit Shammai, because ultimately Beit Shammai is talking about a Kotevet and not about a Kotevet Hagasa. And maybe Kotevet, Stam, is the same as a Kabetza. And he could have said Kabetza, but he just happened to say Kotevet, which is the same. It's like they knew that they were both the same. So I, at the end of this part here, I don't have yet uh, a proof for Rav Zvid's contention that Kotevet Hagasa is less than a Kabetza. So the next proof he's going to bring is from the Mishnah in uh, Mishnah Breita in uh, in uh, Masech Brachot, which you 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 I'm sure you were in the Mishnah, um, and the, uh, it's going to be brought here in the context of a Breita. Well, what does the halacha say? Ah, <laughs> you want to know. You want to know the answers in the back of the book? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we have to look at, uh, at, the, at the Rambam. He probably well, decided, no? I didn't, well, he did, he didn't. <laughs> we, no, no, don't worry. We have an answer, but we, we still have to get through the Gemara here. So, mm -hmm. Okay, so next week we'll go over this part again with Rashi, and then we'll see the next part, which is the next... Uh, uh, which is the next proof for road speed that and then we'll we'll be able to come to a conclusion about uh, for that for now I think that's enough anyway uh it's a, hopefully you absorbed some of it and let it sink in and if you can't go over it it's a, that the argument that we just went through it's it's a little bit subtle, so go over it until it feels a little bit more settled, and you can look in, if you want, look at the Steins also, or whatever, but next week we'll look at Russia. That's it for now. Everybody should be well, and Bezrat uh, Hashem, I'll see you next week. Thank you, Karaka Sameach.